Hello. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. I realize it's Monday morning. It looks like everybody has lots of energy this morning. Um, Dr. Berlakis is going to talk about the DEFINE PCI study. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Good morning, everyone. Um, before the main course, just a couple minutes uh, update on a study we're planning to do. This is called DEFINE PCI. This is a study looking at uh, fractional flow reserve for people who undergo PCI, but not in the way we usually do it, which is before the procedure to see if the lesion is tight enough to need a stent, but actually it's looking after the procedure to see if we've done a good enough job. Now, unless you're an interventionalist, you know, you won't be uh, directly involved in this, but essentially this is just to highlight that the post-PCI measurement essentially is one way to say you've done a good enough job, the stent looks good, going to have good outcomes, and then the plan is to follow them up for a few months and see if they have low rates of um, complications coming after that. So if you see the name defined PCI, that's what it is. We have plans of doing the same thing for chronic total occlusion interventions, so a separate study for specific subgroups. But for the time being, this is uh, up and running, and you may see the name in some of your patients. Thank you. Dr. Alexander, go right ahead. I'll change up. Presentation. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, I am, I, I, everybody may or may not be aware, I'm a pinch hitter. Uh, 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 they were looking for somebody to replace um, Des J, who I'm supposed to give a lot of grief for not showing up and talking about nuclear heart disease. And so you are stuck with me and probably a lot of the usual diversions that come with my grand rounds. I think this is my seventh grand round. Uh, I want to start, uh, since we're going to talk about pediatric vascular disease, uh, just thanking my group for uh, tolerating uh, my activity with the pediatric world. It is uh, very stressful explain why that is a little bit with some of the cases that are going to come up, but it has involved a great deal of commitment from my group to be willing to back me up when I have to go over to children's or their fear of getting called over to the children's themselves or anything. So uh, what I want to start with talking about pediatric vascular disease is uh, the lament of most physicians who have to uh, treat children and then encounter people like us who also um, manage the adults and the fact that there is a tendency for adult physicians to treat kids as though they are just tiny adults, which they are not tiny adults. And they're not tiny adults either uh, socially, nor are they tiny adults when it comes to physiology. So this is where I'm going to get onto one of my tangents and talk about something really unusual for this particular medium. I'm going to talk about the heart. Uh, so in the 1950s, there was a great deal of interest in looking into PR intervals, particularly PR intervals in children. And the reason that, uh, that cardiologists were interested in looking at PR intervals in children in the 1950s was because there was a great deal more rheumatic heart disease at that time. And it was noted that increased PR intervals could indicate a bad prognosis. But what was unclear at the time is what a normal PR interval was in a child. And so this involved a great deal of work to obtain uh, EKGs from uh, over 500 different kids, during which time it was found that PR intervals do seem to increase as you get older, maybe or maybe not with weight. And so that question then begs, do we just have an increased interval of our PR based on our size? And to look into that, several cardiologists who are interested in comparative biology decided to start doing EKGs on other animals. And in fact, if you look at the PR interval in a number of different animals and compare it to the size of their heart, and this is it's actually a calculation, you have to take like the third root of the mass of the heart, but you can see that there's actually a very linear line. So maybe it's true, maybe kids are just small adults because the PR intervals are just based on a linear distribution that you can see here. Well, to try and figure that out, in more detail, some of these cardiologists, in fact, one over at North Memorial, decided to look at an animal that was slightly bigger than a man or a dog. And so what these cardiologists decided to do is they wanted to get an EKG of a beluga whale. 
This is a somewhat difficult endeavor, by the way. If you want to get an EKG like this of a beluga whale, what you have to do is you have to find a beluga whale, and then you have to get it harpooned to your boat, and then you try and take a copper sheeting, put it over the water, and then try and get a circuit running based on a electrical line that you attach to the beluga. I don't know that this is the greatest reading that you've ever seen. Okay, a little bit difficult. I, I would be, if I was in, uh, if I was in ACLF, I might be giving some atropine at this point. That's, that's all I'm saying. But again, the beluga whale, and this is the 1950s. Now, these same investigators wanted to look into getting EKG analyses on larger whales. They tried to go out and uh, get EKG analyses of some gray whales, but they were not able to successfully harpoon the animals close enough to get EKG leads. But there were some smarter investigators. Oh, and I should mention, this is what the PR interval looks like if you believe that last EKG reading. So, in fact, it does con continue to confirm that there's a linear relationship. Again, this is the third root of the mass compared to the PR interval, but it looks like it's just it's a straight line. So P intervals just get larger as the heart gets larger. So some more, some more clever investigators said, why are we chasing after whales and trying to get EKGs after we harpoon them? Wouldn't it be smarter to look at a larger whale that's already beached? or caught in nets. And that's what this round of investigators did and looked at a couple of humpback whales and actually were able to get much better EKG readings on the humpback whales. Now, in order to do this, you have to get one lead onto the dorsal fin, and then one of the leads goes into the pectoral fin, be right around where our brachial artery is. But these are the EKG, again, I'm a little, I don't know if that's ST depression. I don't know if there's ongoing ischemia. I'll leave that up to you. But what is interesting about the PR interval is no, it's not linear. So the stress that we can get fooled so easily by these things, kids are different, whales are different, PR intervals are not the same, dependent based upon size. And so this kind of threw the whole concept of, now, I'm not entirely sure, and no one's entirely sure how the whale gets that atrial depolarization that quickly, because it doesn't really make sense. It's a pretty, pretty large heart, but so the PR interval we would expect would be larger, but somehow it depolarizes quicker than we would anticipate. In case you're wondering what kind of instruments you use in order to get those EKG leads on, these are the harpoons that they use on the uh, beluga whales to get those EKG leads um, attached. They're pretty vicious. And as I said, if you really want to get a good EKG lead, and you want to really get a good tracing, you got to get one on the dorsal part of the humpback whale, and then the other one you got to get under the pectoral fin. That's where they got the humpback whale. And I bring that up because fishing and injury to the brachial artery is the very first pediatric case that I was sent when I came here from Minneapolis. So this is a 14-year-old boy who was out fishing with his dad, and they caught a walleye and they pulled out a flensing knife and he sliced himself across his antecubital fossa. And he did what I think a lot of us Minnesotans would do, or at least a lot of my patients would do. There was a lot of bleeding, so he put pressure on it and said, rub some dirt on it and don't worry about it. And eventually the bleeding stopped and he came back seven months later with this. When I talk about how we're gonna treat this particular pseudoaneurysm, which you can see right here, and some other elements of this particular uh, pediatric injury in a second, but I do want to go over what are we going to cover in terms of pediatric pathology first. So I'm not going to be able to hit everything because there's a lot of variety in pediatric vascular pathology. I would suggest to you that pediatric vascular surgery is not a, is not a specialty within my field. You don't go to a pediatric vascular special uh, a fellowship anywhere. There's very few people that manage a lot of pediatric vascular disease, and just about every case that we see ends up being something that could be a case report. I'm not going to provide you a lot of literature because there's not a lot of literature on it, but I'll kind of I'll fill in what I can. And I'm not going to cover everything, but I am going to uh, talk about some of the things that we've done here at Abbott. I'm going to talk uh, first about trauma, uh, both aneurysms and obstructions. Then we're going to talk a little bit about vascular anomalies, which is what I see the most of over at the Vascular Anomalies Clinic at Minneapolis Children's, and concentrate on a, a few different kinds of malformations and really just one kind of tumor. I am going to talk about a little bit about one of the embryologic derived variants, mid-aortic syndrome. I'm not going to hit compression syndromes, which is what we see quite a bit of here, and my group particularly is seeing a lot more of because of the increase in uh, venous thoracic outlet syndrome and the increased referrals over from children. So I'm not going to hit those 
um, but uh, I, th those those particular areas probably be hit later by future speakers, including Dr. Skate, who likes to talk a lot about May Turner syndrome. But let's get back to this brachial artery injury. So this is pseudoaneurysm. It's become pseudoaneurysmal because uh, the pressure that was held for so long, and the child uh, tried to ignore what was going on with his hand, but was starting to have uh, pain whenever he used his right arm and noticed an increasing bump. And the reason he's having pain is probably twofold. First, the pseudoaneurysm here is pushing on nerves in the area, but the other part of it is that he's developed an AV fistula, so this is arterial inflow going in, and you can see that there isn't arterial flow going down the arm, it's just immediately going into the venous system. So the way that we ended up repairing this was a patch repair of, um, a patch repair of the artery, and we tried to use vein, and we certainly try to be, use autologous, and, uh, autologous tissues in the periphery and kids when we can. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But I also want to mention that one of the things that's complicated with a pediatric patient when you're reconstructing their vasculature, here's this follow-up ultrasound that shows that that vein, and we see this very commonly, particularly noted in kids, is when you use vein, either as patches or as grafts, they arterialize. And they tend to look very much like arteries in the future. It's almost impossible to differentiate the repair site from the patient's native brachial artery at this point. You repair a um, pseudoaneurysm, somebody that's had a cardiac catheterization that's 75, uh, that patient's got a lot of problems, and you're not sure how long you necessarily need that repair to work. But in the pediatric patient, particularly someone who's 14, you're really expecting that repair to last not only a really long time, but it is also possible, as in this patient, that they may decide to subject that particular repair to all sorts of trauma in the future. Not even wearing a um, pad on his arm frustrating me to no end. <laughs> Another thing about trauma with kids is that they get some trauma in some really un I don't know if you guys know this, kids don't always make the best decisions about what they're going to do with their lives. And I just show you a couple of unusual trauma cases. This is a kid that fell and uh, hit his head and uh, developed a pseudoaneurysm in his temporal artery. So this was identified by a primary care physician down in Northfield who got an ultrasound that showed this pseudoaneurysm of the temporal artery. You can see it's uh, this is the temporal artery exposed, and then this is once the aneurysm has been uh, removed and the temporal artery ligated. And some more serious traumas, too. Uh, this is a patient, I'm actually, I should mention, this is actually a patient of Dr. Titus. Thank, thank Dr. Titus for taking care of this, and Clark Schumacher. Uh, this is a... Uh, 14-year-old kid that was ejected from a car during a motor vehicle accident. He was not wearing his seatbelt, and he ended up having an acceleration-deceleration injury uh, at the ligamentum arteriosum. You can see this big pseudoaneurysm of uh, his aorta. And he ended up having to get a thoracic endograft to repair this. It's complicated by a number of different issues. Not surprisingly, he had additional injuries, an ongoing bleed in the head and a liver lack, which complicates decision-making about whether you can use anticoagulation during the case or not. He is actually doing quite well. Two years out, we will be continuing to survey his, uh, his repair. He does have a mildly decreased brachial artery pulse on the left because in order to get a good seal of this endograph, they had to partially cover the left subclavian artery, but he has no ongoing symptoms. I see some unusual presentations in other parts of the body, too. I'm going to talk a little bit about popliteal aneurysms here historically, because we don't see as many popliteal aneurysms in young patients um, as they used to. There's actually a spate of this in uh, the 1700s and 1800s, because, and now we see popliteal aneurysms because people have aneurysmal disease. They get it in the abdomen. They're more prone to getting it in the popliteal distribution is probably related to atherosclerosis and some connective tissue issues. But in the late 1700s, uh, early 1800s, people would get popliteal aneurysms because of repetitive trauma to the back of their knee as cab drivers. It was a known phenomenon where if you were uh, driving a horse-drawn carriage, you would get repeated beating of the back of the, the bench against your knee and would develop a pseudoaneurysm there. It invariably led to death usually preceded by limb loss. And the reason is that as the aneurysm expands in size, it develops a clot inside of it, and the clot then gets sent down into the foot and slowly knocks off vessels one by one. 
first person to successfully operate on this is uh, sort of a historical figure of great importance, the father of surgical anatomy and vascular surgery, John Hunter. And what he realized is that you could operate on the popliteal artery aneurysm by ligating it, not at the aneurysm. That was the problem. Initial attempts to try and ligate right here with the aneurysm led to breakdown because that tissue is also abnormal. And so they were ligating where it was abnormal. And so Hunter said, you know, what we'll do is we'll go through a space that I can find above the knee and ligate well above it. And this will also allow collateral circulation, hopefully, to go around the aneurysm so that they maintain their leg. This particular route meant ligating the vessel right at the adductor canal, which is now called Hunter's Canal, for that particular reason. If you've been to my lectures before, you also know that Hunter was very, very good at convincing any of his patients that he operated on to let him dissect them when they died. So this is the actual first popliteal aneurysm he operated on. You can go see that in the uh, Hunterian Museum in London if you were ever there. We don't see this kind of traumatic popliteal aneurysm very often because people don't drive a lot of horse-drawn carriages anymore, but you can see it on occasion. This is a, a child I saw when I was working in California who noted a lump behind his knee uh, when he was playing catcher. He went to see a sports physician who said, yeah, you've probably got a Baker cyst behind your knee. I'm going to drain it, and sent the patient to an interventional radiologist to have the Baker cyst drained. Unfortunately, it was a bright interventional radiologist who felt behind the knee and said, you know, this actually has a pulse in it. I don't think I'm going to stick a needle into it. And so we got a little bit further imaging. But what you can see is uh, this 11-year-old actually has, whoops, actually has um, a bony tumor. And the bony tum tumor, whenever he was crouching down to play a uh, catcher, would be pressing against the popliteal aneurysm or the popliteal artery and led to disruption. This is actually ended up being a fairly easy fix. It ended up being a, a benign, uh, a benign bony tumor, and uh, we were able to repair the artery primarily. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about occlusions. Um, occlusions are remarkably different in kids, and I'll show you some extreme examples a little bit later because kids can tolerate uh, occlusions that. Adults really cannot. So this is a, um, this is a child, a 12-year-old that was in a snowmobile accident and uh, jammed the handlebars into his groin. This is not um, an unknown complication. Uh, we see this with biking, too. And uh, what ends up happening is the uh, artery ends up getting injured right where the handlebar hits it, leads to an intimal disruption. And then that intimal disruption over time occludes. Now, kids will often uh, not notice anything is wrong at first because they just think that they're having musculoskeletal pain while they're still recovering from taking a bad hit uh, to the groin. And so we see these patients uh, down the line. We've seen three external iliac artery occlusions here, although one was iatrogenically caused by uh, some other surgeon. How do you repair this is an interesting question. What, what, would, what do you use to repair this in a child? And I'm going to talk about that in a second, but first I want to show a picture of me playing soccer. And there's a reason, because this is what happens when you ask your mom to send you a picture of you playing soccer. This is a me, picture of me playing soccer. And there's something important about that, which is a, um, what you're expecting and what you're getting. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the use of vein for autologous bypasses in children. And the reason I bring it up is that if you read most of the vascular literature, the vascular literature is pretty clear. You don't use vein for bypasses, particularly in the legs, unlike we do, say, in the adult population, because the veins will degenerate and become aneurysmal over time. That is written repeatedly in textbooks. <laughs> and the problem is that that's probably wrong. So the literature that that's based upon is first of all a number of case reports rather than a really large series because, again, there's not a lot of people that are doing bypasses or uh, reconstructions of pediatric patients. So case reports don't help me all that much. And a lot of the case reports end up being uh, in patients that have popliteal artery aneurysm. Now, we 
operate on people when we see popliteal artery aneurysms, often at an earlier age, and those patients may live a lot longer. So we have long-term da data on vein bypasses and patients that have popliteal artery aneurysms. But I would submit to you that a patient that has a popliteal artery aneurysm may have something different about their connective tissue that makes them more prone to degeneration, even in their venous circuit. In the patients that have been followed that have had aneurysmal degeneration of their coronary artery bypass grafts, the reason that the degeneration often occurs is because of arteriosclerosis that develops in the vein bypasses. Well, in the pediatric patient population, yes, they could develop arteriosclerosis, but we're hoping that that's not going to be 40 or 50 years down the line, so it's a slightly different population. There is uh, the largest series of patients looking uh, at lower extremity reconstruction and uh, just reconstruction in general using autologous veins all comes out of Michigan, the um, well, very highly regarded surgeon James Stanley. And he's written most of the literature on pediatric vascular pathology. And it's from his work where he noted that 20% of patients that had renal artery revascularization with vein uh, developed aneurysmal degeneration, but it was usually at the anastomoses, and I would also submit to you that bypasses to the renal arteries are very different than bypasses to the legs. And in fact, the only paper that Stanley has written on using vein, pipe, vein bypasses for the legs um, suggests that you should use vein bypasses for the legs. The incidence of aneurysmal degeneration in his population of 25 patients was only two that had aneurysmal degeneration, and those patients ended up uh, having secondary operations uh, Instead, and the reason I bring this up is that the alternative that is explained to us in the vascular textbooks is that you should use hypogastric artery. And hypogastric artery is, A, not the easiest thing to get out of a child, and B, has its own particular problem. So what do we do in this particular case? Oh, so yeah, I should just mention, when your mom sends you a picture of you playing soccer, this is the picture that your mom will send you. Um, what did we do for this particular patient? So, yeah, we use veins. And you can see that uh, what you have to do in a patient that is uh, uh, pediatric age is you have to account for the fact that they're going to grow over time. So we try to some degree, now it's difficult because you want to make sure that you're not causing kinking of the vessel, but you try to allow for a little bit of room for growth. It's one of the advantages of vein. The other advantage of vein and using vein in this particular distribution is that you worry that there's going to be a size mismatch. In this case, greater saphenous vein is slightly smaller than the common femoral or external iliac artery, but the veins almost always dilate about 20% larger than their native size after the reconstruction. But this is what it looks three months down the line. Let's talk about another distribution. So this is a 12-year-old uh, that presented with an aneurysm to the superficial femoral artery. Probably trauma, because we don't have any other reason that it happened. He was once again climbing over a fence. This is what it looks like on cross-section, and you can see the difference in size between the superficial femoral artery on his right and on his left. What complicated this particular repair, which we also replaced with veins, was the fact that the aneurysm had been present for so long that it was obstructing his venous system as well. When I repaired the artery, uh, there was a significant stenosis within the vein, which I elected not to uh, address at the time, and I was hoping that it would be okay. I thought that it would dilate, dilate up over time, but after his first follow-up ultrasound, you can see that there's still a considerable narrow, narrowing in his vein, and then there's a high-grade velocity shift. That's what the bright color there means. And so I put the patient on uh, anticoagulation. So I was very fearful that he would get a deep vein thrombosis, but kids are pretty amazing. And so this is his study six months later. And six months later, because he missed his three-month appointment, he comes back and his veins are entirely normal and there's no evidence of a narrowing. And I told the patient, hey, uh, this is great news. You can get off your anticoagulation. And he said, oh, I stopped taking that at our last. I haven't taken that. Which is also very typical of pediatric patients. Unfortunately, sometimes we cause the injuries too. Oh, it's Dr. Gornick's here, perfect. This is a case that Dr. Gornick and I uh, had. Dr. Gornick presented to me. So this is a young kid, 12-year-old, who uh, ended up having a VTAC defib arrest and required an, uh, an ICD. Unfortunately, long-term 
displacement of the ICD led to superior vena cava occlusion, and the patient developed an FVC syndrome. And so ultimately, together with the ET team, what we were able to do was remove the ICD and reopen the superior vena cava. The ICD had to be replaced into a subcutaneous position, because with everything open here. So these are some crazy operative and interventional ways of handling things. I'm going to talk about something else for a second here in terms of managing trauma in pediatric patients and how it's different. But the first thing I want to talk about is VFIN. Jesse and Jeff, my two colleagues who are our uh, penetrated endograph uh, extraordinary, will be mad at me because they will look at VFIN and say, Jason, you're spelling it wrong. It's VFIN. That's a fancy venous penetrated endograph. But that's not actually what I'm talking about. I'm talking about VFIN, which I'm sure you guys all know is the zebrafish information network. Zebrafish, super important animal. And you guys all know why that is, right? It's super important for the heart. So the reason the zebrafish is really important um, is that, first of all, it's a great genetic model. So we have the entire, uh, we have the entire code for the zebrafish mapped out. It's also very easily manipulated. There's a few other advantages to using it as a model for a genetic evaluation. First of all, they turn over really quickly. You can genetically design them to be transparent, which is super cool, and it also makes uh, embryo harvesting easier. The embryos can survive outside of their parents, which also helps tremendously. Here's an important fact found that you wouldn't think, but in the world of uh, genetic, uh, genetic animal models, uh, they're diurnal. It's really nice to have an animal that, you, that is actually active during the day rather than having to be up at night to follow them. But probably the reason that zebrafish is followed um, most closely is that they have incredible regenerative powers. And in fact, you can remove 20% of the ventricle of a zebrafish, and it will grow it back. And it will grow it back without scar, which is a reason that it is an area uh, of tremendous stem cell, stem cell research and, and uh, genetic research right now. Now, I won't go into the details of that. There's something that Jay Travers and I have talked about. It's fascinating. We don't know how well this correlates to human beings or what we can do to translate one to the other. But you can see 20% of the ventricle gone, and it will uh, heal on its own. Uh, they also regenerate uh, eyes. They regenerate nerves, things that we can't do in human beings. So area of interest. But the regenerative capabilities of pediatric patients are very, very different than adults as well. So this is a four-and-a-half-year-old. This is the first trauma patient that I went over to Children's to see, uh, she was climbing over a fence, which seems to be a recurring theme here, and uh, got her leg stuck and fell over. And it ended up causing a uh, transduction fracture of her tibia. And when it took out her tibia, it also took out all three of her tibial arteries. So this is normal anatomy here on the right with the anterior tib, tibial perineal trunk, perineal artery, posterior tib. This is actually this is an MRI, so this is the greatest stuff in thing coming back. But on the left side, you see the SFA and popliteal come in, and then there's transection of all three vessels here. But we were called three days later when she was in the hospital. And what was fascinating at the time is that uh, despite that injury, she had a viable foot, and she had Doppler signals in her posterior tibial distribution. And so the question is what you do in that particular situation. In an adult, if this happens, A, very, very high chance of limb loss. B, you absolutely have to reconstruct and be a very difficult thing to reconstruct because of the damage in the area. But in this particular case, we chose to anticoagulate the patient. And we anticoagulated the patient, and slowly but surely, she normalized. And she normalized to the point that her ABIs two months later are normal in her left leg. And in fact, that was eight years ago. Here she is playing soccer two years ago, or uh, sorry, two years later. This is her playing soccer two years ago. This is uh, her no longer playing soccer, but at her at one of her uh, brother's games. She has chosen not to play soccer anymore, which is a huge disappointment, but maybe suggests that she is smarter than her vascular surgeon who had destroyed his knee playing soccer. That's all I'm going to hit with trauma, but I do want to talk a little bit about vascular anomalies. Uh, and before I get too far with that, uh, just a, a little advertisement for the Vascular Anomaly Center over at Minneapolis Children's, uh, where I see patients not as much now as I used to. And there's a few reasons for that um, that I'll get to in a second. But uh, with uh, Steve Nelson, who's a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and now Steph Fritz-Willow, who has also helped him. 
Uh, he started the clinic over there in 2007. At the time, he had really no one helping him uh, but one ENT doctor, Dave Seidman. No IR, no vascular surgery, but he opened up this clinic, and when I was uh, hired by Dr. Sullivan, uh, one of the things that I was trying to do was expand the vascular malformations clinic here, and I asked, is there anyone in the area that does something like this? I got a hold of Steve Nelson because he had this vascular anomaly center. I called him up and said, hey, I do some malformation stuff. Uh, would you be interested in partnering up, um, maybe sending patients if they end up being old, older? And he said, why don't you come over and help me with this clinic? Said, Steve, I don't know anything about children. And he said, don't worry, I will teach you everything about children. And so since then, we have been seeing lots of patients over in the Vascular Anomaly Center. So 2009, it, um, is the first data that Steve has seeing patients on the vascular anomaly clinic, 86 patients that year. Um, the initial jump to 131 is probably because of what I'm going to cover next, which is treatment for infantile um, hemangioma. And then the second jump here is probably when I get involved, because then we get a bunch more vascular malformation patients. The numbers actually are slightly decreasing now, and I'll explain why that is, too, because it's all related to mangioma of infancy. So when we talk about vascular anomalies, it's really two different areas. There's tumors, malformations. And tumors, for, and I'll talk about malformations in a moment. Tumors, uh, the vast majority of tumors are benign mangiomas of infancy. And what are mangiomas of infancy? So come on. mangiomas of infancy are a benign tumor that involutes on its own. So they have a really, really rapid proliferation after birth. A lot of the time, especially if they're on the skin, a parent will notice maybe three or four weeks after the child's born, they'll say, it looks like they just had a scratch. And then all of a sudden, this big, big um, mass develops and proliferates, proliferates, proliferates. The great thing about infantile hemangioma is that it then involutes. It usually starts to involute towards the end of the first year. It can take a while for them to involute. Usually 50% are gone by the age of 5, and 90% are gone by the age of 9. And if there's still anything left, they probably weren't really a, a hemangioma of infancy. You say, well, if they involute, if they go away on their own, well, who cares? Why, do we, why, does, why does that bother? And they're going to go away on their own. Well, the problem is that hemangiomas of infancy can develop in parts of the body that can impact development of the child. And so this is a hemangioma of infancy in the eye. And the problem is that if you don't do something about this particular hemangioma, it's going to, uh, it's going to detrimentally impact the patient's uh, visual acuity in the future. The way that we took care of this in the past was to give these kids, now these are all under the age of one, and usually we see these hemangiomas, and they're usually diagnosed between three and six months of age. We would give them intralesional steroids. Imagine injecting steroids into that in six months old. Or systemic steroids or interferon, which some of these things kind of work. If you can, you can surgically remove them. You can't surgically remove that. So what do you do about hemangiomancy? And I'm going to talk about the um, unforeseen benefits of things um, related to the sleeper shark. So sleeper shark. Um, Longest living animal in the world to begin with, which is kind of cool. So they uh, live up to around potentially up to 500 years. Average lifespan is about 350 years. Part of that has to do with the fact they don't really move too much. They live, they're kind of like a permanent coolant patient. They live just above <laughs> freezing. And if you're wondering how fast they swim, uh, they swim about the same speed I do, which is not very fast. So they go about a mile to a mile, uh, maybe a mile and a half, an hour, and they can't get up much quicker than that. They're huge. They uh, are viable and maybe larger than great white sharks. They tend to be scavengers, but they've been noted to have uh, giant squid beaks in their stomach. In fact, there was one that was found that had an entire reindeer in its stomach. I'm not sure how that happened. So the question is, how do they get food? They don't move that fast. Their primary diet is uh, sea lions, and sea lions are a lot faster than a sleeper shark is or a Greenland shark. So how do they get food? Well, so one reason may be the fact that uh, they attract prey due to bioluminescence of their eyes. So you can see that 
they've got this like eyelash that looks like it's lit up. And in the dark, that can be very attractive to other animals, which may get a little bit too close to the sleeper shark. The question is, why do they have eyelashes like that? Well, the answer is that they don't really have eyelashes like that. So that's a parasite. That's a sopapod. It's a kind of um, almost like shrimp. It's bioluminescent. It feeds on the corneas of the sleeper sharks. The sleeper sharks don't need their eye. They don't need their visual acuity because they're in the dark all the time anyway. So it's the symbiotic relationship where these uh, these sopapods end up eating the cornea and at the same time provide a uh, Home, homing light for food to come by. And it's the similar serendipitous relationship that occurred with hemangioma of infancy that allows us to treat those kinds of patients with the eye hemangioma I showed earlier. This was discovered in 2008 by Christine uh, Lotlebrez, very, very nice woman from uh, France. And she was treating an array of different kids who had infantile hemangioma in very, very difficult locations usually in the V3 distribution of the face or in the eye or compression of the airway. And she was treating them as we did at that point with massive doses of systemic steroids. And the patients were having responses to massive doses of systemic steroids, like you would suspect what was happening. They were getting hypertension. They were getting tachycardic. So she put these patients in the intensive care unit, and she gave them a beta blocker. And the beta blocker that she gave them was propranolol. And what happened is once she started giving propranolol, the hemangiomas started to disappear. So it's as close to magic as you will see in medicine. So we have now treated almost 400 patients over at Minneapolis Children's with propranolol for infantile hemangioma. So this is a child you can see that it's almost closing uh, her eye. Now I'll show you a second picture, which you say, well, it's not as dramatic, but you see the eyes open. Here's the you see parents notice a difference in the morphology of the hemangioma within three days of treatment. It is truly like magic. We don't know why it works, by the way. It is unclear why it works, and there's a lot of study trying to figure out why beta blockers melt hemangiomas. Um, it is interesting to me at uh, the uh, International Vascular Anomalies meeting for the last two years that I've been there, I have raised my hand and I've said, I also do a lot of work with stem cells and adults because no one else at these meetings ever does, is ever in that situation. And I say, so we know that beta blockers are stopping angiogenesis in these infantile hemangioma patients. And my question is, uh, we have all these patients that are in stem cell trials where we're trying to grow vessels and we're trying to incite angiogenesis. Should we be making sure that these patients are not on beta blockers? It seems like that would be a big mistake. So, uh, and I haven't gotten anybody to bite on that, but I think it'd be a really interesting project if anybody is interested in looking into that. So we treated over 400 patients with um, infantile hemangioma. That's the reason that we saw uh, the first uptick in the vascular anomalies clinic. Part of the reason that we're seeing a downtick now is actually primary p uh, pediatricians are becoming very comfortable using propranolol themselves. How do you give it, by the way? Um, it's, it's oral. You put it in a syringe. You just squirt it in the back of the child's mouth. They swallow it. There are a few side effects, and actually, um, uh, Kate Zimmerman, one of the uh, research interns that I worked here with, them, uh, who uh, wrote this chapter with Steve and Dr. Sullivan and I, um, uh, also published a paper on the complications of propranolol. So there's not a lot of complications of propranolol. It's a very benign drug. We've been using it for a very long time. Actually, the, the primary issues end up being GI-related, which is constipation and diarrhea. And they cause night terrors, which is something that can be a problem in kids. It can be very difficult to determine what that is because, you know, we're talking about kids that are under the age of one. So now I'm going to move on to uh, malformation. So we talked a little bit about tumors, infantile hemangioma. And infantile hemangioma is uh, a series of cells that gets the wrong direction to turn over, turn over, turn over, turn over, but it is not, uh, doesn't have any capability of metastasis. Vascular malformations are different. So the way I think of vascular malformations in the pediatric patient population is that, you know, at first you're a bunch of cells. Cells are all the same, right? I mean, we're a bunch of cells, and then all these cells have to differentiate into different things. They've got to become a kidney or a heart or an eyeball, or part of the skin. And it has to get directions to turn into those things. 
When you have a vascular malformation, what occurs is that some of those cells get the wrong direction and they're told to turn into something that they're not supposed to. So cells that, in like this patient who has uh, Wyburn-Mason syndrome, uh, the cells that were supposed to turn into parts of the eyeball and the brain and the face instead get directions to turn into vessels and then become a large AV malformation. This is an adult patient, so I'm not going to go into his particular case. Um, these are extra vessels that develop, so they're, the normal vasculature is usually there. And you can develop malformations in any kind of vascular bed, meaning that it can be anywhere in the body, but also it can encompass veins, it can encompass arteries, it can encompass lymphatics, or a combination of those. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them and how we have to manage those in the pediatric patient population. So the first thing to be aware of with vascular malformations, with very few exceptions, surgical excision doesn't work. The hallmark of taking care of a vascular malformation in patients historically was to try and remove it. And in 1965, Zulagi wrote this paper on 18 patients that he excised, and they all came back. Well, it's not true. Two didn't come back, and in retrospect, those two were probably from angiomas, not malformations. So the problem is they come back, and why do they come back? And I'm just going to a quick diagram of this. So here's a patient that's got a malformation on their thigh. The problem is the area of abnormal cell development probably extends way beyond what you're seeing there. And what's happening is the area that looks grossly grossly abnormal is sending negative inhibitory feedback, don't grow, don't grow, don't grow, don't grow. So then you excise that, but you still have areas that are abnormal, and they've lost that inhibitory signal. They've lost the don't grow, don't grow. So what happens is they come back much larger. And that's the reason that surgical excision doesn't work unless you really go for broke and try and take out a huge portion of um, the tissue in the area. What looks abnormal clinically underestimates what's abnormal at a cellular level, and even um, the radiologic exam underestimates that as well. This is a real patient, by the way, or at least my diagram was. This is a patient that came back with huge malformation uh, after having excised a few years earlier. So what do we do? Well, there's a number of different options. The first question with a malformation is, do you need to treat it at all? Because they're not a tumor, a cancer. They're not going to go anywhere. The question is, are they obstructing things? Are they causing pain? Are they going to ulcerate? Otherwise, what we try to do is we try to manage the symptoms as best we can. So here's a venous malformation, which is notorious for coming back, and a patient that uh, Yasha uh, Kadkadayan and I injected with Sotradecal. This is right on his chin. And we got a really, really good result initially. And when I say a really good result, like a frightening result, because we had to put the child in the hospital for two days because he swelled up so bad we were worried about his airway. And we thought that means we really got it. And it disappeared, and it looked great, and it was wonderful. But unfortunately, I had to come back two years later for a repeat treatment. And that is um, sort of the sine qua non of treating venous malformation. But sometimes we're not looking, and it's very rare that we ever get a cure but sometimes we're not looking for a cure. So this is a patient with, this is a 12-year-old that has an AV malformation on his foot. And it looks like it's coming off of the anterior tibial artery. The reason that he presented was that he had developed an ulceration. It, the malformation was eating through the dorsum of his foot, and it was bleeding. And in fact, he was requiring occasional transfusions because of the bleeding, impacting his ability to participate in school activities. So with an AV malformation, the goal is to try and get into the nidus. This is the nidus. This is this really, really ugly area where the arterial system connects into the venous system and try and close that off. There's some question as to whether, well, what, why don't you just take out the, the artery that's going into it, the anterior tibial artery, and I'll explain why. You don't do that in a second. So here's a bunch of glue and onyx that we put into the nidus. And you can see here that that's all filled up and that we don't get that big development of uh, the AV malformation is significantly, but as AV malformations are wont to do, it came back, and so we had to do a more extensive and repeat treatment with more onyx. But now, very limited AV malformation in the foot, and that was long enough for him to heal. Ultimately, however, some of the glue got into the anterior tibial artery, and we took out the anterior tibial artery. Now, we've got other arteries, skip the foot, and that's fine. But the reason that you don't want to take out that inflow artery is because it provides you a route to get to the malformation. And what do malformations do? And in this particular case, now he's healed now, so we treated him successfully, but now he's got blood vessels, his posterior tib and perineal artery that 
are filling the foot, which is good, but also starting to feed the malformation in a different distribution. And actually, in the end, can look worse than when he started, although now he's healed, which is good. But this is why we have to treat them symptomatically and often repeatedly. Lymphatic malformations are slightly different. They're slightly different malformation for two reasons. So I've kind of given you depressing news about venous malformations, which recur, and AV, mal AV malformations, which recur. Lymphatic malformations, for some reason, tend to be uh, they, they tend to be much more circumscribed um, in many, many situations. So if they're macrocystic, you actually have a better chance of getting them out. If you surgically resect them, they won't come back. And they do really, really well if they're macrocystic with injections. And there's a bunch of different things that you can use. Probably the most well-studied uh, solution is bleomycin. Um, there's also OK456, which they have over at uh, Children's within a study. You can also use uh, glacial acetic acid. Um, those are all options. The problem is that not all lymphatic mal malformations are nice and uh, circumscribed. Some of them are more diffuse. People get things called lymphangiomatosis. And so in those situations, you need another option. And fortunately, uh, ever since uh, Dr. Labrez identified propranolol as a treatment for infantile hemangioma. There has been a plethora of research looking for different medications to try and treat some of the vascular anomalies. So Denise Adams started a study in 2010 looking at the use of rapamycin, an immunosuppressive agent, for patients with lymphatic malformations that were more diffuse. This was based on the fact that when a patient has a lymphatic malformation, and one of the ways you can sometimes tell when a child comes to see us and we're trying to differentiate what kind of malformation they have, if they indicate to you, yeah, it gets a lot worse whenever I have the sniffles or when I have an upper respiratory infection or something like that. When the, when the immune system gets going, the lymphatic malformation will become more active. And so the idea was, why don't we use something that ramps down the, the immune uh, response? And so this is what rapamycin was used for. And in the original five patients, they actually had rather dramatic impacts. These were not um, your routine lymphatic malformations. These are situations where they were looking to do just about anything. Patients that were chronically intubated, like the patient, the first patient in the study, actually this patient right here, um, was sent from Steve and I uh, to Denise Adams because the patient needed uh, long-term tracheostomy and chest tubes for chylus pleural effusion that wouldn't stop. Rapamycin, remarkably good at that. And now, updated study with 57 patients and probably over 200 treated across the country. Few more, uh, few more complications associated with rapamycin, but it's remarkable that even in diffuse situations, you usually get a partial response in almost all the patients. You do have to watch the rapamycin levels very carefully, and the patients are more prone to infection, so we usually put them on PCT prophylaxis with um, back room. So what do you do in a patient that's got a combined malformation, which is this situation? And it's a tricky situation of a patient that's got a venolymphatic malformation. She's <clears throat> just over a year old at this point. And the problem with this particular malformation is that with its location, she's going to develop, um, she is going to fail to, to develop um, adequate movement of her arm. Her arm's going to become non-functional if this isn't treated. So you can see it has that bluish tinge of uh, a venous malformation. See how large it is. And this is what it looks like. And most of the bright, um, uh, the bright area is lymphatic in nature. She was also having a consumptive coagulopathy, so she re kept requiring platelet transfusions. But in this particular situation, what we had to do was we had to surgically resect as much of the malformation as we could to begin with. And then follow up with rapamycin to try and take care of anything that was left. Because there was no way with this particular distribution of the malformation that we could get rid of all of it. And so we took out as much as we possibly could and tried to spare everything we could so that her arm would be functional. She lost several sensory nerves, but we were able to keep all of her um, motor nerves and also keep her uh, artery intact. We did have to take her axillary vein, but we wrapped her and wrapped her and wrapped her. And she did really, really well. Uh, and she continues to do really, really well, although the venous malformation of that portion of that will probably come back. And in the future, we'll probably have to treat that with some kind of injection therapy, but not until or if she becomes symptomatic, which she hadn't to this point. This was also another one of our 
uh, research interns uh, ended up publishing this and presenting it out in Colorado. Last thing I'm going to hit really quickly because uh, the, the timing is going to work out well is mid aortic syndrome. So uh, I'm not going to talk about coarctations, which I think tends to be more in the realm of uh, cardiothoracic surgery. Although I will say that uh, we have seen at least four patients that have come back to us through the congenital heart uh, disease program that have had previous coarctation repairs that end up getting post uh, post uh, and uh, post repair aneurysmal degeneration. Um, these are best treated in this day and age with thoracic endografts and extra anatomic bypasses. It used to be that the way that you repair these aneurysms where they developed after the coarctation repair from the youth was to go back into the chest and try and repair it with a graft. The complication rates from that are exceedingly high. There's fairly high paraplegia rates, nerve injury rates, and those rates are much, much smaller if instead you put a thoracic endograft in and uh, do a bypass. So we've done at least three of those particular cases here. Mid-aortic syndrome, a lot more complicated than your routine coarctation, though. So these are, and it's unclear why this happens. There's a number of different potential problems. Some of it may just be intimal hyperplasia, certainly associated with diseases like neurofibromatosis. The problem is that you get a narrowing within the aorta right at the level of the visceral, bevel, visceral vessels or just above it, and it can lead to extreme complications of renal vascular hypertension. The traditional way of handling mid-aortic syndrome was open operation. And again, Dr. Stanley, who I mentioned before, has a large case series, and his results are really, really quite good, considering the fact that you're putting young kids through, pediatric, uh, through very, very large operations and trying to sew vessels that are extremely small, notably the renal arteries. And one of the reasons I bring that up is that the reintervention rate on the renal arteries is incredibly high. So even when you're sewing the renal arteries back into new aorta, you have a 20% reintervention rate. And it is always frightening to read these studies because while they point out that the results are quite good, um, there's always a mortality rate that is not insignificant. And when there's a not insignificant mortality rate on a pediatric population, it causes a little bit of tachycardia in everybody, which has led to the current management strategy for mid-aortic syndrome, which is to, first of all, treat aggressively medically for as long as you can for the renal vascular hypertension. Patients are not symptomatic. They're not ha having any demonstration of consequences to their heart. They're not having any stroke symptoms. They're not demonstrating claudication symptoms. And you can get them under control with medication. You try to medicate them for as long as, they can, as you can to get them closer to the age of maturity when you're going to have a better chance of reconstruction being successful. And similarly, even at that point, we try to be much more aggressive about endovascular solutions, at least to get them to the point where they're large enough that a definitive operation will be more successful. What ages do we see these patients in? This was a patient that was we were called about last week. So uh, you can see here, this is the right renal artery. This is the aorta. This is the left renal artery, which is almost non-existent. And you'll notice that the aorta and the patient's SMA are almost exactly the same size. It's a little bit concerning. Here's another picture of that. And once again, you can see the aorta is diminutive in size, right renal artery here, but you can almost not see a left renal artery. And the other thing I want to point out here is you can see that the hips have not developed yet because she's 18 months old. We're working very hard on medical, medical management on her. There's a good chance, just based on what's happened to her kidney here, that the way that her renal vascular hypertension will ultimately be treated is likely to be a nephrectomy because her kidney is probably not going to develop forward. But here's another patient that we saw. This is a, a nine-year-old who not fully developed. Once again, really, really tiny aorta compared to the SMA. You can see the patient's right renal artery here. There's no evidence of the left renal artery. And that's with a reconstruction that you can appreciate here as well. And we do angiogram on this patient. And first of all, look at the massive collaterals that have developed off the lumbars. This is all to feed the lower extremity because of the narrowing that occurs in the aorta here. You can see the right renal artery with probably a narrowing there. You can't see the left renal artery at all. So this is somebody that we try very hard. They've been maximally medically managed to treat them endo first until she gets larger and see if we can reconstruct her then. So this is after treating her with balloons, and now you've got flow into the left renal artery and better, better aorta. Still not great, but better. And we're not trying to get perfect at all by any stretch of the imagination in this particular situation. But in order to do something like this, it's somewhat complicated. I think 
Jesse would be proud of me to see all these wires going into all these different things. He's a nine-year-old, and we've got, uh, from the legs, we've got wires going into both renal arteries, and then one for the aortic balloon, and then one coming down from the arm, which is very complicated because you have to do a brachial artery cut down and then repair that nine-year-old brachial artery is somewhat intimidating because it really spasms down when you repair it. But we got a pretty good result with that. Sometimes, though, we do have to talk about open surgical repair. So this is uh, an uh, 11-year-old who uh, had been treated for mid-aortic syndrome with a stent for quite some time. Unfortunately, the stent was undersized, and he had recurrent hypertension. You can see that the stent is really, really tiny. Um, we had been hoping that with endovascular interventions, we would be able to continue until he grew to full size and then talk about bypassing around this. Unfortunately, he developed something called PRESS, which is a persistent reversible encephalopathy, encephalopathy syndrome and had to be admitted to the ICU at Children's a couple of times. So ultimately, we did bypass him. And this is the bypass, which ultimately comes off of his thoracic aorta down to the infrarenal aorta. His renals are not involved, so he gets flow back to his renals in this particular uh, direction complicated about this repair is that you have to count on him getting bigger, which means you have to use as large of a graft as you can trying to account for how big he's ultimately going to be. And then you also have to um, take into account that he's going to grow vertically, and you don't want this to be in, uh, under, uh, under tension over time. So you try, to put some, um, you try to put some extra length into it, and he's doing very well so far. The last thing I'm going to talk about real quickly, and I'm just going to hit it under time, um, is one case that I don't have an answer for. But um, during my past talks, I've, I've mentioned Robert Liston, who's uh, a hero of surgery. Uh, Robert Liston was known as the fastest surgeon in the West because he operated in a time just like John Hunter, who operated for popliteal aneurysm before there was anesthesia. So there was a reason that operating fast was a good thing because you wanted your surgeon. Operating fast now, I'm not sure, makes as much of a difference. It's nice to decrease anesthesia time, maybe. But in this day and age, operating fast was important. And he was known for operating fast. And in fact, there's four famous cases. And I'm going to talk about them. But part of the reason is that I've never had a reason to relate uh, Liston to his, his fourth, most favorite case, uh, fourth most famous case. But I'm going to hit that one last. So his third most famous case was removal of a 45-pound scrotal tumor that a patient actually had to carry around in a wheelbarrow. The second most famous case was uh, an amputation uh, that he did in uh, two minutes. But uh, during the amputation, he also accidentally took off the patient's testicles, I think is an error. And then his most famous case uh, is uh, a patient that he did an amputation in two minutes, but he also accidentally took off two of his um, assistant's fingers. And he sliced through the coat of one of the observers. So the patient, as a lot of these patients did in this era, died of sepsis. His assistant, who had his two fingers removed, also died of sepsis. And the person whose coat got cut went into shock and also died. So it was an operation with 300% mortality. But his uh, fourth most favorite case, uh, most famous case, is uh, a query that occurred on the wards where one of his colleagues took him to see a pediatric patient with a pulsatile mass in the neck. And their thought was that this was an aneurysm. I said, do you think this is an aneurysm? And Liston, being who he was, said, there's no such thing as an aneurysm in a child this young, and immediately took out his knife to lamp the abscess that it was not. And that patient did die of the aneurysm that was in the neck, which leads me to uh, this patient that just presented to me a few weeks ago. He does have and the aneurysm in the neck. It's not coming off the carotid artery. I'm not going to stab that with a knife yet. But, uh, and we're not sure why that this has happened. This patient doesn't have any history of trauma. My concern is that there's going to be a component of connective tissue disease. She's got some uh, unique aortic valvular insufficiency that shouldn't occur in a 12-year-old either. But we will be getting more information, and she'll be getting an endovascular procedure and probably some tissue removal at some point. So I will update you. I'm just going to finish uh, since we talked about a bunch of different nautical animals. And because uh, the last presentation I gave, I talked a bit about giraffes and the fact that we know that 
despite what the internet will tell you, giraffes do not have valves in their carotid arteries. And I promised that I would also talk about aortas and whales at this particular presentation. Um, the internet is also wrong about whales and blue whale hearts. If you read um, on Wikipedia, you'll be told that the whale heart weighs 1,300 pounds and that you could swim through the aorta of a whale. And that's actually not true because they just got a blue whale heart out and they, are now ha they now have it on display in Toronto. Um, a true blue whale heart weighs about 400 pounds. The uh, aorta itself, uh, not as large as you would expect. It's about uh, nine inches in diameter. So you'd have to be pretty small to swim through it. Uh, but another inaccuracy. And it may be that the reason that we don't see the linear relationship with uh, the PR interval when we look at whales is because the hearts don't need to be as big as we thought that they would, as they would be predicted to be, because they may not need to uh, pump blood as hard because of the dynamics of living underwater. Um, it's 8 o'clock, and I would be happy to answer any questions if anybody has some. I would. Any questions? I think you answered everybody's questions up front. 